Well, there it is. Today's study. I've got you covered. I've got you covered. All right, you can come to me. Now, we're going to have a fascinating Bible study today, so be sure to have your Bible at the ready, the notepad, the pen, the VCR rolling, and let's spend one hour in pursuit of the things of God. In this ministry, we are not interested in fluffing stuff, in religiosity, in religious ice cream. We want the real McCoy. And we're on a journey. Many, many of us across this nation and other nations too, we're on a journey to get to know the Lord and to get to know Him better. There's a fascinating word in the Hebrew taken from the Old Testament called the Kapareth. Kapareth. K-A-P-P-A-R-E-T-H. The Kapareth. The Kapareth means the covering. Now, the strange thing is, the word in the Hebrew is used relating to all three arks that we talk about in the Old Testament. You remember Noah's huge ark that was made for the saving of his family. Well, it says they covered it with pitch, or the word is bitumen, B-I-T-U-M-E-N, bitumen or pitch. They covered it. The word is from Capareth or some cognate of Capareth. And even uh, Moses' little ark that he was pushed out in, uh, into the Nile on, it also was covered with this pitch or with this bitumen. The word is capareth, or as I say, some cognate of it. Cognate are words that come from the same root. When we come to the tabernacle in the wilderness, the same word is used, even though we're not at this point talking about pitch or slime or bitumen. Uh, we're talking about the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, and then the mercy seat that sat on top of it, which was beaten out of one piece of gold with the two cherubim uh, carved out of it also, sculptured there in that one piece. That is called the capareth, or the covering. You see, in the Ark of the Covenant, which was a box made of acacia wood, shittim wood in the Bible, overlaid within and without with pure gold. What a wonderful sight it must have been with the three items in there, which I have discussed on previous programs. And we are in the box. We are in Christ. Then there was the covering or the mercy seat. And of course, when the high priest would come in there, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, once a year, he would bring blood from the brazen altar where the animal had been sacrificed. He would splatter it seven times on the floor, stand upon it to show that you could only be acceptable by God as you stood upon the blood of a substitute. Then he would also splatter the mercy seat so that it was a blood-splattered capareth or covering. Now, when the word covering or capareth comes to us uh, into the New Testament, and then, of course, finally into English, but into the Greek, then into the English, and you know that's through what we call the Septuagint. That's when uh, uh, 70 scholars met at Alexandria a few hundred years before Christ, actually, and they translated the Old Testament from the Hebrew into the more popular Greek. That's sept, because the sept is for 70. And uh, they brought it through, and when they did, the word for capareth or covering that we end up with uh, from the Greek and then into the English is the word propitiation. Sounds like a big word. It is a big word. It has a simple yet profound and powerful meaning. Propitiation, which does mean, of course, you're covered, but it also means the forgiveness of sins and the place where favor is restored. I want you to remember that. And the Bible teaches us about the place of the propitiation and then the propitiatory. Uh, where the blood was shed, and then where the blood was applied. 
And of course, all these things coming from the tabernacle in the Old Testament are types and shadows of Christ, which was to come, and who has us covered through the gift of righteousness, D.K. Usini or D.K. Usine uh, is the gift of righteousness in the Greek language, or sometimes people simplify it and say we're covered with the blood. This marvelous doctrine of the capareth, the mercy seat, propitiation, it's all called the covering, where we are covered with Christ's righteousness. And we're not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by His grace alone. That's Paul's clear message. So what we're talking about is the capareth, the covering, propitiation, the propitiatory. And I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be drawing for you again here, or sketching for you, the tabernacle in the wilderness. But I have to tell you, I am going to go back again onto some of the things which we taught in our last program a couple of weeks ago on this very subject. The reason is this. I feel from the Holy Spirit that <clears throat> we, we rushed it a little bit and that I could uh, do it more in depth if I took it a little bit slower. Now, we'll also cover new ground and refer to different scriptures so it's not just a duplicate program. But a lot of the basics regarding the covering I have mentioned before, we will just take it further in this program. Now, we're going to get my sketch pad ready. Here it is. I'm going to give you the outline of the tabernacle, the three rooms, the seven pieces of furniture, and then explain again the covering, which, by the way, is typified by the ceiling of the tabernacle. And it's like God breaking it down into four parts, four layers, so that we can get a deeper understanding of what is meant by the capareth, the covering, the propitiation, the place where you're covered. That is, your sins are covered. Therefore, because they have been removed, past, present, and future, Therefore, that is the place where favor is restored. All right, let's go to my sketch pad, if you would, please. And let's have just a quick outline here one more time. Now, this may be the last for, for quite a while. I come back on it sort of every year. But here we have an outline of the tabernacle. This was like a, a tent wall. It was made of uh, linen. It was white, and it was seven and a half feet high and 150 feet long. And this was the north side, the south side, the west side. Over here is the east side. And here was the only opening. Now, all of this speaks of Christ and of us in Christ. God gave this to Moses as a teaching tool so that we would understand God and Christ and salvation and us in Christ covered. There are, look at this figure up here, there are 50 chapters about this in the Bible, so you can be sure it's extremely important. Here there was a veil. The people could enter in with the animals, and they were to meet with the priest here called the brazen altar. I pointed out in week one, it was to be three, four, five. I'm not going into the significance of that again, other than it was three cubits high, four sides, and five cubits on each side. It was very, very significant. The people were not allowed past this, but the priests were. This was the place of sacrifice and answers to Calvary. So we come through Christ to God, meeting with God at Calvary, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Then the priest would go further, and the priests would wash in the laver, the laver which was here covered with water. And then there was this part which is sometimes referred to as the tabernacle proper. This was different. This was um, 15 foot high, and it was made of boards. And this, except for this, this was a veil, and this was another veil here. And this part here is called the holy place. And this part was called the Holy of Holies, or the holiest of all. The priests would go in here and minister to the Lord. And on the north side, there was a table, which was the table of showbread. 
I've already dealt with that. Then there was the menorah, the, 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 the candelabra, the lampstand. Then there was the, the, the ark, the golden ark, the golden table of incense here, which would ascend unto God. This speaks of our tithes and offerings. This speaks about being led by the Spirit. And this, of course, over here speaks about our praise and worship. And then once a year only, the high priest would go through this veil to this ark, the Ark of the Covenant with the three items in there, and then the mercy seat on top of that, he would get blood, let's go back over here, and a, and a vessel from here. And this is called the propitiation, the place where our sins are forgiven. By the way, on this day when he went in there, the people received forgiveness for 12 months. The 12 months passed. That's not like us, but that's what happened to them in the Old Testament. This was called the propitiation, the place of forgiveness of sins and where favor was restored. But once a year, he took blood with him into here and he would splatter it. That's what it is in the Hebrew. Splattered it there in front of the ark and splatter it here right on the mercy seat. And so this place here is the propitiatory. This is the place where it was applied, but over here was the place where it was shed. This was the place where the blood was shed. This was the place where the blood was applied. And so this is the propitiation. This is the propitiatory. This is the place of the covering. And this, of course, is what really produces the covering because this is the shedding of blood. Come back to me if you would, please. Now, I want you to get all of this. But I want you to hear something else. We're coming almost immediately before we go for our first break. We're going to come back to this. But I want you to hear this. The tabernacle proper, as it's sometimes called, the, the place that was built of, of boards of acacia wood, 15 foot high, that's double the size of the outer uh, perimeter, which was like a tent wall. And the outer court, it didn't have any covering, no roof, no ceiling. But the inner part did, and there were four coverings. I mentioned this the last time, but I'm going to go further this time. It has four coverings. And obviously, if you're on the inside, you can only see the most immediate one. If you were looking from without, you could only see the outer one, which means that there are two in between, number one and number four, which are never seen. And this is God's way of saying to us, these things are vitally important. They're part of the teaching on, quote, the covering, just as the Ark of the Covenant is the place of the covering. So these coverings of the roof further develop the meaning of the covering by breaking it down into four. Now, teachers do this all the time. They'll make a point and then they'll say, now let me break that down further. This is what God does. And the fact that two of them are permanently hidden from view shows that many people don't really understand the depths of the teaching relating to the covering. Hebrew is the kapareth. It's a marvelous word. It means to cover. Literally, it is a, a picture word in the Hebrew, and it means like Madame Guillotine. When the guillotine is falling to take somebody's head off, and something gets in between and covers the person's head or neck so that the guillotine cannot get through, then they're covered. That's a perfect illustration of the capareth. Or as I say, when we get it from the Hebrew uh, through the Greek and finally into the English, the propitiation. The covering, the forgiveness of all of our sins, never to be remembered against us, no more forever. And then, of course, the place where favor is restored. Go back quickly, if you would, please, uh, one more time to my sketch pad. These are the boards. There was a total of 48 boards, 20, 26, and two corner ones. And uh, this was 15 foot high all around and there were coverings over this, and there were four coverings to further explain the doctrine of the covering. Come back to me. Uh, I come from a land that's known a lot of violence, a lot of wars, and oftentimes you would hear from the soldiers, 
That old statement, I got you covered. You go do this, and I've got you covered. Well, the doctrine in the Bible of God saying to us, I've got you covered, is something absolutely beautiful and magnificent. And we're going to come to it momentarily so that you will understand more than before what is meant by the doctrine of propitiation, the propitiatory, the capereth, the covering. He says, I've got you covered. There was no covering on the big utter court, but there was a covering over what's sometimes referred to as the tabernacle proper, that is the holy place and the holiest of all. I talked about this on a previous program recently, but one more time, this is going to be more in depth. The covering was to be four ply, four layers. The first one was to be of fine twined linen. And then the next one was to be of goat's hair, curtains covering made out of goat's hair. In fact, the first one sometimes referred to as the tabernacle. It was just the covering. It's referred to as the tabernacle. And sometimes the second one is the tent. We'll refer to them as the ceiling, the roof, the covering. Then there was... The third one, the ram's skins dyed red. And then the fourth or other one was the waterproofed one, which was of badger skins, but really in the original, it's porpoise skins. So we have these four. I want you to get them now because the teaching from these four enlightens us to more depth relating to the phenomenal Christian doctrine of the capereth, the mercy seat, the covering. Remember, God will not meet with us any other place. He doesn't meet with us at the place of our good works or because we pay him off or because we're a Protestant or we're a Catholic or we're neither or whatever. God said at the mercy seat, the capereth, where the covering is, the blood splattered covering, there I will meet with thee. Maybe you've been trying to meet with God at the altar of positive thinking or good works or money in exchange for miracles. No. He said, I will meet with you at the capereth or at the propitiatory. That is, where the blood which was shed at the propitiation has been applied at the propitiatory. And so there are these four, the fine twined linen, the goat's hair, the ram skins dyed red, and then the other one was the badger skins. Now, if there are 50 chapters in the Bible, and there are on teaching of this, what can a man do in one hour on television? But by looking at some things we did not look at on our past programs, we will learn some things new about the doctrine of the Capereth. First of all, the fine twine linen. Here's what God said they were to do. They were to take a big, can you imagine like a rectangular strip of uh, fine twine linen like this, and they were to stitch it together with another one, and then another one, and another one, another one, until they had five stitched together. Then they were to do the same with another five, for God said it would be a total of ten. Now, the reason why it's five and five is because five in the Bible, in biblical numerics, is always the number of grace. So this was grace upon grace, grace meeting grace, to uncover us. The first thing that we have to have in order to be covered to be in Christ, decausene, to have the covering of his gift of righteousness, is to understand that it's all by grace. Now, when the five were sewn together, and the five were sewn together, then God gave details of how they were to be lashed together. And this was the way. He said you're to make 50, 50, 50 loops, L-O-O-P-S, loops of blue. Can you imagine, you know, just little loops right down one edge, 50 loops down the other edge. Now, 50 in the Bible always speaks of harvest time, a harvest of blessing, and blue always speaks of heaven. This is a gift from heaven, the gift of salvation. And they were to bring the two pieces together, loop upon loop, all 50 right together. And then God said they were to get clasps 
tashes, the Bible calls it, clasps in the English of gold. And they were to clasp the loops together with gold, gold speaking of God. So here the priest, and we are the priest today, all of us who are born again are kings and priests unto God. We are in the holy place. We're surrounded with these walls of uh, marvelous gold. We're in God. And then above us, or surrounding us, or covering us, cappereth us, is this fine twine linen. And the way it was brought together was with the blue loops and the clasps of gold. But then also there was embroidered into the fine twine linen, the cherubim, large, it stretched over both the holy place and the holiest of all. And the cherubim with outstretched wings was guarding. Remember, these were the creatures that kicked out Adam and Eve uh, in God's displeasure from the Garden of Eden. And now this is saying God, for they represent not angels, but God. God is protecting this position of the believer when he trusts that he's hid with Christ in God and that this is salvation. We don't need foolishness in the church. We don't need emotionalism. We need the teaching of the scriptures to teach us what we are in Christ. You're in the holy place. You're in the box. You're covered with gold. You're surrounded with gold. You're protected by God, for God protects this wonderful message of salvation, us in Christ. How do you get in Christ? It's simple, though it's profound, by allowing Christ in you. And then the embroidered work was to be done with different colors. It was to be in blue. Again, it speaks from heaven. It was to be purple because it's royal. See, he, he, he's a king. Uh, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We are a royal priesthood. We are sons and daughters of the king. How marvelous it is. And then, of course, the other one was the scarlet. Scarlet red, speaking of the blood. And so there were the four colors. There was the, the, the blue and the purple and the scarlet. And, of course, the overall color was white, the righteousness of God. So we're covered with what? We're covered with Christ's righteousness, the gift from God. It is from heaven, that is the blue. It is royal, that's the purple. And it is scarlet, that's the blood that has been applied. Oh, we need to rejoice. You know, all day long the devil will want to condemn you. He will want to make you feel guilty. The truth is this, we're in God. We're in the box, we're in the holy place, and we are surrounded by God. Now, throughout the Old Testament, for instance, in the book of Psalms, more than the book of Psalms, but in the book of Psalms particularly, there's repeated reference to this business of the holy place, even when it doesn't say that. When it says, for example, I'm abiding under the shadow of your wings. I'm in your place under the shadow of your wings. That's David talking about the ark, the holy place, the holiest of all, and being in God. And he knew a certain amount, and today we know even more because we are in the New Testament with the illumination of the full scriptures and of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be giving you a bundle of scriptures. Well, let me say a bundle. I'll give you at least six, which talks about us being protected by the wings of God as we are in Christ. You know, so much of preaching today is either ecclesiastical deadness or it's money for miracles, or it's emotionalism, it's a thing of laughter and fun, instead of an understanding of what we have in Christ and of where we are, we're covered. God says, I've got you covered with the blood and with all the things that speak of the blood. I've got you covered. All right, you can come back to me. The gospel is a wonderful thing. It's, it's being so perverted these days. The message of the blood in many areas has gone out the window, but it's, it's a magnificent thing. This is the believer in Christ through his trust, through his trust. 
salvation is complete. The Bible says, Ye are complete in Him, Him who is the fullness of the Godhead, in bodily form when He was upon this earth. We're in Him. Now this idea of being covered and being protected by that covering is referred to repeatedly in the book of Psalms. And I'm going to read some of the scriptures. You should write them down or, or I guess record this or whatever. Psalm 17 verse 8 to give you the first one. And I can only mention them on the way by. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. What, what was he talking about? This is David. He's talking about the, 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 the holy place, the holiest of all. And the, the cherubim looking down there, protecting this great message of the covering. God says, I've got you covered. When the devil's out to snipe at you and to destroy you through guilt or condemnation or whatever, I got you covered, God says. This beautiful scripture, we're kept as the apple of his eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wing. The big chair you've been, we're looking down there in beautiful embroidered colors. It must have been a magnificent, exquisite, breathtaking view from the inside. Now, of course, if you were looking from the outside and saw those poor poised skins, they were not too much to look at. Recently, Mooring and my wife and I, we passed a home that was for sale. And evidently, they must have done a lot of work on the inside and not yet the outside because there was a notice outside that actually said, you got to see this place from the inside. And I, I take those exact words and say, you got to experience Christ from the inside. To many, there's no beauty that they should desire Him. They just see religion, and it looks dull and drab. But when you see Him from the inside, unto those of us who believe, let me tell you, He is precious. And then if you go on over to Psalm 36, verses 7 and 8, are absolutely beautiful. How excellent! Is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of man put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. We're not talking about an embroidered cherubim. That was the type and shadow. We're talking about a living God, and we're in him. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. The way it puts it here is, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of man put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Stop, stop putting your trust in your own good works. Nothing wrong with good works until you start to trust them for your salvation. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. See, David here again is talking about God's house. This is the picture that he has in mind. And he said, those that put their trust under the shadow of that, those cherubim, which is of the Lord, he said, they're going to be abundantly satisfied with the fatness, with the adequacy of your salvation, as typified in God's mystery house. And then when you move into that position, the next thing is, you will make them drink of the rivers of thy pleasures. The river of thy pleasures. Oh, that there was only more time to uh, talk about these, and there's not. I'm going to go on to Psalm 57 and verse 1. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. The whole thing's trust. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed until the calamities of this life and of this world be overpassed. We're going to trust in the covering, the capereth, the propitiation, where it was applied. Now, when Christ died for us, he died at Calvary. That's the propitiation, the place of forgiveness of sins and the restoration of favor. Where was the propitiatory for Christ? Well, that was in heaven. He took the, 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 the blood into heaven and said to the Father, set the people free on the basis of what he did at the place of propitiation. For us, we enjoy the whole thing. 
and the fatness of this wonderful mystery house. Then there's another one here in Psalm 61, and this time verse 4. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert, in the protection, in the covering of thy wings. Selah. I think of Boaz uh, even speaking to Ruth, and he said to her, you've come to trust, he said, uh, in the God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. It's the covering. It's the capereth. It's the blood. It's when you trust that what Jesus did on Calvary is adequate for you and for your eternal salvation without works. I say again, without works. Yes, works will follow. We're not against good works. We're not against being nice to people. But I'm telling you, your salvation does not depend on works. It depends upon trust underneath the covering, the capereth, the propitiation. I've said it over and over and over. I say it this one, perhaps uh, one more time. Let me give you one more. Psalm 63, verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. You've got to understand salvation, the covering. Not guilty you've been declared because of the application of the robe of righteousness. And then one last one here. You know, everybody, <laughs> it seems like everybody knows this one, but I'll read it again anyway. Psalm 91 and verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers. You know who wrote Psalm 91? Moses wrote it. He sure knew what he was talking about. He borrowed this from the teaching of what God had given relating to the holy place, the holiest of all as well. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thy trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. What are the wings? What's the capereth? What's the propitiation? It is the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your sacrificial lamb. He is your substitute. And when you trust in him, then you're in God, surrounded with righteousness. And you've got the blue that says it's from heaven, and the purple that says it's royal, and the scarlet that says it's the blood, and the white that says it's God's righteousness, which is given to you as a gift. Oh, I've got you covered. Come back to me. The Capereth, propitiation, the place of forgiveness of sins through the shed blood, that's what the covering is, and the restoration of favor, further explained by the four coverings. The next covering up, and one that couldn't be seen, was of goat's hair. And uh, it wasn't five and five, it was to be five and six. This was a bigger covering. And five was for grace, six is man's name, and uh, a man's number, excuse me, and so it was God's grace meeting man's inadequacy. And it was to be bound with clasps not of gold, but of brass, which always speaks of judgment. Because the goat always spoke of the substitute, Remember I told you last program they took two goats, uh, one uh, to show the living Christ, one the dying Christ. Uh, one goat was slain. The other one, the priest uh, Aaron put his hands upon its head, transferred all the sins, and we can add sicknesses of the people to the head of the goat, and then a fit man. See, Christ is everything. He's the offerer. He's typified in the goat. He's in the blood. He's the priest. And he's the fit man, an adequate man, then took that goat, bearing the sins, led him into the wilderness, the Bible says, to an uninhabited place from whence it could not return ever again. It was gone forever. And so the goat skins, which were not seen, uh, or very, very, very little of them, uh, one little bit at the front, and I'll tell you about it in a second as, I, as I've got time. Uh, th this is things that are hid from people. People don't understand it. That is the substitute. He died for you. You don't have to die. He died for you. That's part of the covering. And this time there was 11 
curtains. So one of them fell a bit over the front, but it was doubled back up again. And uh, when things were doubled in the Bible, it's the same Hebrew word that's used, for example, for the uh, high priest breastplate, which was doubled uh, to form a bag uh, type of dress where in were held the Urim and Thummim. The Bible says we have uh, received double for all of our sins. Now, the reason for that is this. Let me just show you something here. Let's just say this sheet with some writing on it uh, were the debts of a certain person in Israel, which they would post at the gate of the city, which was like city hall. He was in debt to somebody. When it was paid, they didn't remove this. They just doubled it so that you could just see white it was removed. That's what's meant by the doubling of our sins. God does that work. And this was shown at the front where the goat skins were doubled, showing that it's a double happening for the forgiveness of our sins. That is through a living goat and through a dying goat. That is to represent Christ our Savior who died for us, but who lives forever to ensure that he's the adequate man who blots out our sins forever by taking them as the fit man of what it says in the book of Leviticus in chapter 16, verses 19 through 22. He takes them to an uninhabited place. They'll never be remembered against you no more forever, blotted out as a thick cloud. Now that was hidden from view. Most people don't understand it. Then there was the ram skins dyed red. People didn't see that either. And of course, that speaks uh, of, uh, of Abraham and Isaac and the ram caught in the thicket and the whole doctrine that's there. And then, of course, the badgers or the porpoise skins uh, were the outside ones. I think I told you in the last program, they caught those porpoises in the Nile, brought the material with them, according to Ezekiel, to make shoes. God said, give them up for me. I'll take care of your shoes. Their shoes never wore out for 40 years. Neither did their feet swell. It's another proof. We take care of God's house and God will take care of us. Here I've done it again. I've rushed again. And I can't come back on it, but I can give you the notes. This marvelous doctrine of the obliterating of all of your sins by the hands of a fit man, an adequate man called Christ, taking it to the place from whence your sins will never be recalled, they're gone forever, gone forever, gone forever. It's all typified in the caparis, the covering, which is further explained in the four layers that was over the tabernacle proper. There was the fine twine linen. There was the nax layer, goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, which were really porpoise skins. Too, too much. I wish you would come to our services here in Tarpon Springs every Sunday morning. At 10 o'clock, we got ongoing teaching on this and on many other in-depth subjects.